Special Agency Formation commis Commission meeting dated Wednesday, August 1st, 2018. And at this time, if the clerk would please call the roll. Commissioner Peters? Here. Greenwood? Here. Jones? Here. Harrison? Here. And Frost? Here. Thank you, we have a quorum. Okay, and if everyone would please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I'll go get another one. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, this meeting of the Local Agency Formation Commission is cablecast live on Metro Cable 14, the Local Government Affairs Channel on Comcast, Consolidated Communications, and AT&T UVerse. The meeting is also webcast at www.sacmetrocable.tv. Today's meeting will be repeated Friday, August 3rd at 9 a.m. and Saturday, August 4th at 1 p.m. on Channel 14. This meeting is also closed captioned. We ask that you would please turn off your cell phones or noise-making devices. Speaker slips are located in the back at the table, in the back, uh, and on the speaker podium. Please fill them out and hand them to the clerk. And our, uh, we are beginning our meeting uh, without our chair who is en route in traffic. So um, I know that um, Director Hume will be here soon, but in the meantime, we will um, move forward with public comment. And I wonder if there's anyone from the floor who has public comment that does not relate to any of the agenda items. And seeing none, we will move on. If, uh, if there is anyone that would like to address the uh, commission on any matter that's not on the agenda. Um, and so, Madam Clerk, if you would please read the first item. First item is the consent calendar, items one through three. Okay, do we have any comments or questions regarding consent? Madam Chair, I move consent. <clears throat> we have a second I'll second that. I will second. second that. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Motion carries unanimously. Next item is item number four, City of Elk Grove, Sphere of Influence Amendment, Grantline Road, Multi-Sport Complex, Public Workshop. Good evening, good evening Vice Chair, members of the Commission. This evening you, you, you have an, a public workshop on the uh, sequel review of the pr proposal there's no action requested or required by your commission. This is just to get the input from your commission this evening on the document and the project and any, any thoughts from the public as far as uh, ideas that should be covered <coughs> during the CEQA analysis. Uh, the project <coughs> is a sphere of influence with uh, about 560 acres. Uh, it's being, being driven by the city of Elk Grove uh, you may recall they, they, they initiated this back in 2010 with the purchase of 100 acres to develop a multi-sports complex, uh, primarily soccer at that time. Uh, the commission uh, recommended that they instead move towards uh, a more cohesive sphere boundary and, and as opposed to a peninsula. And so the inter intervening lands between the project site on south of Grant Line Road and, and uh, east of Highway 99 are included in this application. Uh, there's an MOU between the, your commission and the City of Elk Grove to uh, co-lead the CEQA document. And in, in doing so, it will, your commission would take action first in time for the sphere of influence. In the event that's approved, it would go to the City of Elk Grove. They would do the land use, local land use entitlements, including pre-zoning and uh, ultimately that annexation proposal will come back for your consideration. Uh, the, the, the EIR public comment period was uh, runs from 
June 29th through August 14th, and comments may be submitted uh, on, online at saclafco.org or uh, <coughs> dir directly this evening. We, we have Matthew Gherkin, the environmental consultant who pre pre prepared the document. He has a brief presentation for your commission. I'm happy to answer any que questions, otherwise turn it over to Matthew. On. Uh, can we get the PowerPoint for the item, please? You, you have two microphones there. Hello. There we go. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Uh, Acting Chair Frost and members of the uh, commission, thank you for um, taking the time for this short presentation about the project that Don just mentioned. I'm going to review the project really quickly, talk about the CEQA process, highlight the findings, but you have all the details in your packet, and then talk about the next steps and take your input and input from members of the public. Um, the project itself, oh no, I'm going backwards. Sorry about that. The project location is shown on the, the slide that you see uh, southeast of Grant Line Road, east of Highway 99, about 561 acres, as Don mentioned. Here's a closer view. Uh, and this slide also uh, depicts the approach to the analysis in the draft EIR, uh, looking programmatically uh, at a conceptual level at environmental effects for the entire proposed sphere change area and looking at a more detailed level or a project level at the 171 acres shown in the crosshatch there. Uh, a land use exhibit also uh, shows the, the assumptions that were used for the environmental analysis. Uh, looking at commercial office and industrial land uses along uh, Grant Line Road, industrial land uses along the Union Pacific Railroad track on the western side of the project, a mix of land uses in the northeast, and then the 171 acres of uh, multi-use sports facilities sort of in the center of the uh, plan area. Uh, here's a closer view at the sports facility itself. Uh, this would have training space and competitive venues. It would have uh, tournament and practice fields, community support building, an amphitheater at the south end with an assumed maximum capacity of 9,000 seats. The project, as Don uh, intimated, involves a number of actions uh, for LAFCO's consideration and also a number of actions uh, from the city that would re be required to fully implement the project. They're shown on this slide, including annex, uh, sphere uh, change for the city of Elk Grove, but also to the Sacramento Area Sewer District and Sacramento County Regional San Station District, some detachments, and, and ultimately annexation to the city of uh, the sports park uh, portion or maybe some or all of the remaining sphere areas uh, coming up. The project objectives are an important framework element for the environmental document uh, and they include uh, to provide sports training and competitive venues, to be complementary of existing facilities and relieve pressure off sports facilities that weren't designed for tournament events, to provide space for special events uh, like perhaps the county fair one day, uh, to, to help with the city's jobs housing balance by providing land for uh, employment development and to expand the sphere in a way that's consistent with LAFCO policies. Uh, CEQA's job, California Environmental Quality Act, uh, its job is not to recommend approval or denial of a project but to evaluate potential effects, to develop feasible mitigation, look at alternatives, obtain input and consider comments, uh, and, and disclose ultimately the environmental effects associated with development of the project. The CEQA process is shown on this slide, starting with a notice of preparation a while back, asking uh, agencies and the public what should we study in this environmental document. As Don mentioned, the draft uh, EIR is out right now through August 14th, uh, so we're still accepting comments. The next step would be a final EIR responding to comments and then consideration on, on the project itself after considering certification of the document. It's a full scope EIR, it looks at, like, uh, it looks at all of these topics, which I'm not going to read, uh, but it studies everything uh, under CEQA. Uh, there are certain findings that I'm just going to highlight. Again, you have the full details. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. 
the scale of this project and this project type uh, means that there will be significant and unavoidable effects. They're shown on this slide, visual resources, ag, air quality, bio, cultural, energy, greenhouse gas emissions, land use, and short and long-term noise effects. There are also a number of impact areas uh, they are significant, potentially significant, but they are fully mitigated by mitigation that's going to be imposed through the EIR. We also look at cumulative effects, not just with this project, but this project plus, plus other development in the surrounding area and region. It's shown here. The next steps after uh, the end of the public review period, we'll review all the comments that come in, both verbal that are offered this evening, as well as in writing and respond to each of those that has to do with an environmental effect and then publish what's called a final EIR, which will have those responses, as well as any clarifications or revisions to the EIR. I'm going to leave this slide up here. It's uh, a reminder to everyone in the audience and watching of where comments on the draft EIR can be sent to Mr. Lockhart here with the contact information and also where uh, members of the public can review the draft environmental impact report. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm happy to answer any questions. I apologize for my tardiness. It took me 40 minutes to get from the 16th Street exit to here. I don't know what's going on, but I've never seen downtown traffic the way that it was. Um, any questions for uh, present, uh, presenter? I have a couple questions. Sure. Commissioner Harris. I realize this is a draft for EIR, and some of the questions I have perhaps are going to be answered in the comments you receive in the final EIR. A couple questions would be one, uh, the sports complex talks about 171 acres required for that facility. I read in here that the city owns 96 acres of that 171. So as a city, uh, assuming they can acquire the additional property, it's going to be donated. Has the city taken a position that perhaps they would do eminent domain if necessary? How are we dealing with the property that we're planning for that we don't, that the city doesn't own? That's question number one. Question number two is, I haven't found it, and perhaps it's in here. I apologize if I missed it. But I'm looking for input from the Consumer News um, Community Services District, who I believe is your park and recreation provider for the city of Elk Grove. And I would be real interested in knowing what the district's position is about the sports facility, i.e., is there a need for such a facility? Is there any potential that they may be asked at some point to operate? And if so, do they have any views about operating the facility? Uh, so those are, I'd be interested in hearing from the Park and Recreation District that I believe operates most, if not all, your Park and Recreation facilities currently, or perhaps this is going to be privately operated, I'm not sure. So those are the questions I'd be interested in, is how do you deal with the property that you're planning for but that you don't own? And secondly, the Park and Recreation provider for that part of the county uh, is silent as far as the materials that I have. Thank you. So we have a representative of the city, but I can tell you, I've never, I don't know where that 171 acre uh, came from because every uh, schematic I've ever seen was fully contained within the 100 acres, not 171. It's actually in this document here. Which document is that? Mr. Chair, if I may, Christopher Jordan with the city of Elk Grove. Um, <clears throat> what you're seeing up there on this slide is um, the a larger uh, programmatic build out of the larger site, which was considering um, ultimate development of this larger agri-zone uh, component as well as the stadium piece. What we've been talking about with the council as recent as September of 2015 um, was sort of a core project, which is what's really analyzed in the EIR at the project level basis of this field complex and the support building. Obviously, there are a lot of details still to figure out in terms of um, are there subphases within that component or um, and how exactly is the financing piece come to it? Um, to your point, though, about the CSD, Consumer CSD as the parks provider, we certainly have talked to them. They are aware of the project. They do have a rep here this evening that I understand is listening to, um, to the comments that come in, and they are uh, potentially even providing comments by the 14th as well. Obviously, we talk with them as a case in point. Um, our new aquatic center, which the city is constructing as part of our civic center project, We've arranged a uh, long-term contract with them to operate it for us, so they take care of all the ongoing maintenance issues as well as the programming and day-to-day -day function of the facility. Um, their staff will be inside the building. So we've not closed the door to any operational uh, structure to this. There's still a lot of details to work out on that. 
All right, thank you. Thank you, Chris. My apologies, I, the, the 171 is for the full with the stadium and the fairgrounds, and those are all future considerations. And in fact, the fairgrounds was added on at the request of that landowner that, that would, that's a use he would like to potentially see. Mr. Mutant, did you have anything you wanted to add from the perspective of the CCSD? Thank you. Um, Paul Mutin, uh, Chief of Planning at the Kasumnas Community Services District. And to what uh, uh, Mr. Jordan just said, um, we'll be providing comment by August the 14th, but as uh, Mr. Jordan uh, uh, illuminated, is we have a relationship with over the Aquatic uh, Centre, and we so also have a memorandum of understanding about how we develop future parks. So um, we'll be working with the city over the next week or so having discussions about some of those operation al alternatives and then be providing some comment for before the um, August 14th date. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Any other questions at this point? No, in that case, I'll open it up for public comment. I have one person signed up to speak. Ms. Petchy, if you would come down. And Suzanne's is the only speaker card I have on this item. Good evening. Um, for the record, I'm a resident of um, the area, um, Agres in the uh, Omochumis Hartnell Water District, which uh, this project um, lies within the boundaries of that district. Um, I just briefly skimmed the DEIR for this project and the soccer complex, and I again saw several pages of discussion of um, SCWA as the logical water purveyor of the area, identifying it as the um, uh, water uh, pur purveyor, um, retail water provider, and in as Zone 41. But as a public member, you know, I'm kind of wondering about the the consistent use of this uh, untechnical term of logical because it seems to leave so much open to discussion and so inconclusive. And um, it as as a resident of the area that has really been involved in the Sigma process, you know, I just want to again address the fact that OH. Um, in, is in an overlap situation with other water districts, SCGA, SCWA, and these overlapping areas have not been, um, are, are being negotiated, but certainly not decided at this time. So the question I have really is about the letter of uh, November 19th, 2015, from Elk Grove Water District, where they indicate an interest in providing, being the water purveyor for this area. And I'm just wondering why, um, in 2015, when the letter was written, why this, there is no discussion of this in the DEIR as to what, how they would provide these services. And I'll just read you just a little bit of it so that you can be familiar. Elk Grove Water District has an interest in providing effective and efficient retail water service to the proposed SOI amendment area. While this area is currently designated for retail water by Sacramento County Zone 41, Elk Grove Water believes it could provide the same service by purchasing wholesale water from SCWA and is currently doing so and so and so and so and so. So where is the discussion of how this service would be provided, this alternate service. So when um, are we going to hear about it in the final EIR, or at some point in time, are we going to see the plan, or is this going to be left open-ended? So um, I really brought this up at the OH meeting a couple of weeks ago at the board meeting, because again, when they talked about the soccer field and the impact that it would have on ag and what the issues they might have in the annexation of this property by the city of Elk Grove, the, war, the possibility of Elk Grove Water District being the purveyor was thrown out. This is not within their boundaries. To my knowledge, they have not submitted a boundary application. I clarified that with Mr. Wakeman. He assured me that there is no application on file at this time. So I think we need some definite clarification. Mm -hmm. This needs to be fleshed out. We need to talk more about it. If this is what's going to happen, the citizens out there, Ag Res, really needs to know about it, and we need to know what, if any, impact it's going to have on our wells. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else from the public wishing to speak on this item? Okay, seeing so, no one, I will uh, close public comment and move to deliberation. 
Any further questions of staff? No? Okay, <coughs> Commissioner Frost. Uh, I just wanted, I had a quick question relating to the Williamson uh, mitigation around the Williamson Act. Is that just on the sports complex property because of, of the change of use? And what is the timeline on that mitigation? Like if they put their application in to um, withdraw from their contract with the Williamson Act, what is the timeline? Because they wouldn't want to do that after until they were prepared to actually annex it. And what, what, what I would suggest, uh, perhaps, that can, since this is a, 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 a public workshop to receive comment on the EIR as opposed to have a, a, a dialogue about the project and various aspects, mm -hmm. perhaps we can just introduce that into the public record for con uh, consideration through the DIR and FEIR process, and I'll, I'll be happy to discuss that elsewhere at, at the close of the, of the public comment. Okay. I didn't understand that. Bit. Let me, though, uh, this is Matthew Gerken again from ACOM. Uh, I would just want to clarify that all mitigation in the document is directed to the whole of the proposed sphere of influence amendment area. And there is additional detail for the sports facility portion of it, where mitigation particularly applies in that area. But we're looking at the whole of the impacts and mitigating all potentially significant effects for the entire 561 acres. So it's not just for the sports complex. Right. Correct. Thank you. I have an. And so the timeline you're saying we can discuss at a later time is that what you're? Yes. Talking? Correct. Okay. okay. Commissioner Harrison. Yes. While the uh, district representatives here, CSD representative. I want to make it clear that what I'm hoping to see uh, when you comment on the EIR, the EIR, the, the project, if you look at the cover of the EIR, it's actually titled Multi-Sports Complex Environmental Impact Report, even though that's only a portion of the 561 acres. Sounds to me like, looks to me like the project, the SOI, is primarily being justified on the basis of the need for the sports complex in that location. And so I'm hoping from the CSD in your response to the IR that you would not only respond to the IR comments, but also respond to the need. Because in expanding this boundary, a lot of it's based upon the need for the sports complex in that location. And given that it's going to be at the southerly boundary, potentially of an annexation for a regional sports complex, I'd be real interested in knowing how the CSD feels about the location and the need for that type of project, particularly a need for the project from a park and recreation need standpoint, which is what you do, but also from the standpoint of the location being a good general location to serve the objectives of the complex. Just That's for the district to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments at this time? Yeah, Commissioner Jones. Thank you. <clears throat> I uh, share the concerns that Commissioner Harrison has in regards to uh, let's work together between the uh, existing CSD, their soccer programs, and any potential development here. I think it's very, very important that we have a, a sustainable and thoroughly vetted potential for activity out there. So thank you for mentioning that, Commissioner. Very good. All right, seeing no further comments, this is a receive and file. Madam Clerk, if you'd call the next item, please. Next item is item number five, City of Folsom <coughs> annexation for a proposed corporation yard. This, this project, you may, you may recall, was uh, introduced in, uh, <coughs> earlier in 2015, uh, excuse me, 17. Uh, at that time, your, your commission authorized uh, the the commission and the uh, city to go into a joint MOU again for co-lead agencies. The idea here being this is site specific to the footprint in question, the affected territory for annexation. Uh, it, your commission was the lead agency for this for the sphere, took action on the, on that proposal, uh, approved that sphere, and went back to the city of Folsom for uh, land use entitlements, the general plan amendment, as well as pre-zoning to an industrial designation. 
in, uh, as an initiation resolution to initiate this annexation. Also, in the interim between, <coughs> between your actions of in June of uh, this year to approve the sphere, we put to, you, you, you applied various mediation measures and terms and conditions, uh, most particularly the, the, the need for the city to prepare a plan for services to lay out how services would be provided uh, without harming the existing ratepayers or service reci recipients, as well as any, any implications to the detachments from the various effect affected special districts. Uh, this, the city has responded to and given an updated plan for services that uh, speaks to the concerns raised by your commission. They have also taken the time and uh, have uh, negotiated property tax exchange agreement with the County of Sacramento and included in that agreement is a memorandum of understanding for with the county as far as transportation requirements for future, potential future uh, improvements as a result of the uh, uh, <coughs> stretch of the uh, capital southeast connector going through the northern edge of this of this property uh, they also have a uh, property tax exchange agreement uh, to cover their their proposed detachment from the Sacramento Metropolitan Fire District so that the the district remains whole for the loss of territory and, and there's not an undue service burden placed on them in the interim as a result of their actions uh, projects located as I mentioned the southeast corner of Prairie City Road and uh, White Rock Road at Abutts, uh, the City of Folsom, the 2012 Folsom specific plan area south of 50, that's presently uh, under development, under construction. Uh, that they'll they'll be tapping off of the both of the uh, financing that was that was put in place for servicing that larger 3,500 acre area, as well as the infrastructure infrastructure to uh, pick up water, uh, sanitary sewer. Uh, transportation improvements so uh, it, 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 it would seem appropriate or see, it, it would seem that the, the services have been well thought through for this for this uh, particular area it's being driven by local issues within the city of Folsom uh, they have uh, several courtyards scattered throughout the community uh, often there were uh, in, in areas that were uh, over the course of time developed with some inappropriate or non-complementary non land uses. So they're not necessarily be, uh, being the best of neighbors. And one of the thoughts is to move, uh, to consolidate all those operations into this location. It's, this location is give or take 60 acres. Uh, quite a bit of that would be uh, dedicated back to the right, right away to facilitate development of the uh, connector. Uh, it, 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 one of the interesting things about this, because it's a, privately owned by Aerojet right now. It's being conveyed to a government entity, so the parcel does not exist right now. Uh, the, fit, the footprint of the, of the corp yard, the 60 acres, so they would be going through the necessary, we've worked it through with the county surveyor's office, they'd be going through the, ne the necessary machinations to create the parcel and fee title. To, uh, that's probably, it's not creating a parcel, but it's creating the, the conveyance I, item so that the city has fee title to this area and the balance of the larger parcel would still comply with county uh, land use, general plan and zoning criteria. Uh, one of the conditions that we proposed and you applied at the sphere stage and we would recommend you carry forward here is uh, there is a, a provision within Cortesi Knox, the LAFCO uh, statute that if uh, lands are annexed for a municipal purpose uh, and but that municipal purpose seizes the lands are conveyed to a private interest in this case it would it would uh, the division of land would, would would revert and the sphere of influence and the, and the annexation would also uh, sunset and it would go back to unincorporated area so that's the it's a, uh, the, the city has agreed to that it's because it re reinforces their commitment to develop the site for a, for a uh, corp yard <coughs> 36 of the acres uh, of the acres will be committed to the corp yard. About 16 acres is going to go for right away to the north on, on the north northern alignment. There's going to be a, a reservation of uh, five and a half acres. This is part of the MOU between the city and the county for uh, p potential necessary improvements as Scott Road is reconfigured and the connector comes through. Scott Road would uh, be reconfigured with Prairie City. Uh, the 
uh, western neighbor to this project site is Prairie City OH, uh, to the state parks uh, off highway vehicle recreation area. And this, they're, they're supportive of this realignment in that it actually allows you access to the Prairie City uh, venue off of Prairie City Road. So they see that as a marketing benefit as well as just better operations. I, I touched upon the property tax exchange agreements. I touched upon uh, within the plan for services, it was necessary for the city to clearly articulate, clearly spell out where's the water going to come from. Uh, they have done so with uh, previous previous adjudicated uh, efforts to serve the Folsom plants, Folsom plan area adjacent to the north. Uh, it, it, it's the opinion of staff that they have satisfied the requirements of the plan for services. We, we do have city staff here to answer any questions you may have regarding public works, water, uh, and uh, the city attorneys here as well. Uh, I just want to... Uh, Wrap up real quickly, just again, Metro Fire, uh, the detachment uh, has been uh, mitigated through a property tax exchange agreement. The other uh, detachments are, in some cases, paper districts. Their, their level of services are in this area are, are non-existent or negligible. Their revenue streams are not being adversely impacted to impact the rest of their, to adversely impact the rest of their, their capacities uh, throughout their service areas in this area of the county. Uh, with that, I'd, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, uh, I, I, as I say, we have st staff here from the city to answer any clarifications for you. Okay. I, first of all, I, I just have a procedural question, and, and this has to do more with the ordering of the agenda. It would seem to me like we should have heard item 7 and then hear item 5. In other words, why are we hearing the annexation and then we're going to hear the final sphere of influence and, and MSR, et cetera? Uh, item seven uh, on this evening's agenda, or on the agenda that's in front of me. That's, that, that, that's from the, that, those are the minutes from the June meeting. Executive uh, officer or, comments. No. Well, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not sure, but the, the item on the item on this on this agenda, you, you took action on the sphere of influence in June. I apologize, I don't have. I thought we had, but I, okay. I think the blue sheet is incorrect, so just strike off that number seven. All right. That's a little. Sorry. It makes a lot more sense to me now. Okay. <laughs> a little agenda Thank you. management. Thank you. Okay. Questions of staff. <clears throat> no. Okay. I do have someone signed up to speak on this item. I'll open public comment and uh, William Van. Hello. Uh, my name is William Van Vine, and I'm from the Sacramento Valley chapter of the California Native Plant Society. I'm here to urge the commission to hold off on approving this project until proper vegetation surveys have been completed. The lack of usable vegetation data has resulted in a misrepresentation of the habitat type as annual grassland, thereby artificially reducing presumed habitat quality and ignoring proper mitigation responsibility. The characterization of this project site as annual grassland is incorrect for the following reasons. First, in section 6-19 six, six of the final EIR, a comment letter response reads, habitat classification is based on a 2008 special status plant survey of the project site. The problem with the statement is that the shelf life for the time frame of usability of rare plant surveys is generally two years. Uh, data is generally only accepted at two years uh, within performing the actual survey. Second, comment response 6-19 also states that there was a reconnaissance level survey of project site by a biologist on November 9th, 2017. Please note that a reconnaissance level survey is not quantifiable plant data and cannot be used for decision making. Also please note that this reconnaissance level survey took place during the month of November, an inappropriate time of year to survey this area. In support of this, I would like to reference table 3.4-4 in the final EIR titled Normal Blooming Period for Special Status Plants with Potential to Occur on the Project Site. This table indicates that only one of the eight spe species that could occur in this area would be present during November, thus making a reconnaissance level survey during November insufficient. Third, all the species listed in table 3.4-4 in the final EIR are plants that are only found in vernal pool and wetland habitat. 
This table directly contradicts the characterization of the project area as annual grasslands. Instead, it indicates that the area is home to several vernal pools and wetlands, both of which are unique habitat that is home to a number of threatened and listed species. Fourth, use of sim a simple use of Google Earth shows the area crisscrossed by seasonal streams and vernal pools with connectivity to the adjacent wetland habitat to the east. By disrupting the hydrology of this area, it has consequences not only for the rare vernal pool species at the project site, but also for the adjacent area and the local ecosystem. In conclusion, the lack of usable biological data about the project site prevents the commission from being properly informed as to the actual environmental import impacts of this project. Because of the lack of usable data, I urge the commission to hold off on a decision today until proper biological assessments have been performed so that you may make a well-informed decision. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Van. Anybody else wishing to speak on this item? Okay, seeing no one, I'll go ahead and close public comment. Uh, as was just elucidated uh, to myself, the item for the final environmental impact report was heard last meeting. That would have been the appropriate time to receive comments uh, on the adequacy of the study? Uh, and, cor correct. And I believe we, we have received written comments that reinforce what the, t the testimony was just uh, offered. We, we do address the, the written comments on page 10 of your staff report, re essentially reiterating what has was discussed in the uh, draft DIR and the mitigation monitoring plans. Very yeah, good. We do have staff from assent if you want to further question, discuss the matter. Okay. Any other questions of staff? Commissioner Harrison. Well, I guess I'm not quite following you down. Are you saying that we received in writing these comments that we heard tonight and staff or the city responded to these comments? I, I responded. I, I contacted uh, our environmental consultant. with the, I, I provided that written comment and asked for them to uh, provide a response. That response has been incorporated into your report uh, on page 10. Oh. I think it begins on page 9. Okay. Bottom of page 9 and then over to page 10, uh, essentially citing, uh, citing the points raised and then the or alluding back to this, the uh, analysis, analysis prepared in the, in the draft DIR. And so the analysis and the response is codified in the final EIR? Yes. Your comments simply refer back to those? Yes. Okay. Yes. And that is a different role. You're using the EIR that was prepared previously when you were acting as a lead agency, so it is on the SOI, so it's a little complicated, but it's the same document that the city has adopted um, as a lead agency as well. So that's where we're at. Okay. Did that make any sense? Clear as mud. Right. Welcome to CEQA. <laughs> any other questions of staff? No? In that case, I'll entertain a motion. I would, I, uh, uh, is it okay if I just say one thing? Sure. Um, I had pressed this, but I guess it didn't show up on there. I'm sorry. Oh, it actually it had. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, this makes total sense. I want to thank the city of Folsom for working with everyone and staff to make it happen. It's in the perfect location. Um, it's logical um, with all the growth going in on that side. Uh, it's on the way to the landfill. And um, so I'll second the motion if someone hasn't. It sounds like someone has, so I'm sorry I'm a little slow I, on the Actually, end. I don't believe we have a motion or a second at this point. We'll, we'll hear oh, Commissioner comments okay. and then. Okay, then I'll move. Okay. okay, I'll second the motion. All right, so now we have a motion and a second and Commissioner comments, Commissioner Greenwood. I'm, so, I'm sorry about that. I actually was a, a question I had to staff, and, and you made reference to the, the comments that were made by the, the public comment that was just given recently. Were you referring to your response on the bottom of page nine in, in terms of the public right. comment? Right, that's referencing the, 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 the discussion that was provided from the uh, similar written comment for the FEIR, excuse me, the final EIR. Okay. For me, for me, for one, it, it, at this late date, after like I said last time was the time for those kind of public comments to have been vented, and I also have a chance to respond to them, it, it, it seems a little late. Uh, I tend to concur uh, with uh, uh, Commissioner Frost also that this thing, uh, this whole process, this particular one, the 58 acres, makes sense. Uh, I think we've been through this a lot on this already. 
and uh, I think we're all prepared to vote. Very good. Any further comments? All right, if you'll signify a motion by Frost and uh, seconded by Peters, if you signify your vote. <clears throat> Very good. Passes unanimously. Mr. Chair, thank you, everyone and members of the commission. Thank you. We're grateful for your consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Madam Clerk, if you would please uh, read the next item. The next item is item number six, Bilby Ridge Landowner Initiated Proposed Sphere of Influence Amendment to the City of Elk Grove. This project is, as, as just mentioned, has been been initiated by the landowners. Uh, it's located uh, south of the city of Elk Grove. It's a sphere of influence amendment. It's within the urban services boundary, so it's already within the service areas for Sacramento Area San uh, Sewer District and Regional Sanitation and the service area for Sac County Water Agency. You may recall other projects in this uh, neck of the woods that don't always have that same kind of coverage because of the urban services boundary dynamic. Uh, it's, a, it's give or take uh, 450 acres uh, with, with uh, surrounding existing development down the north, the northwest and east, similar uh, uh, fairly low density residential suburban development. It kind of fills in a little piece that was not brought forward during the incorporation process. Uh, there was the dynamic in, pl in play of uh, the projects around it were being processed or being approved by the county prior to incorporation, this land, these lands were not actively being, uh, or were not actively seeking development and the, the uh, city boundary was drawn around this area. This kind of, this kind of fills in the southern boundary. Uh, the uh, southern boundary is a little bit of a, a point of discussion. Uh, it, it roughly aligns with Camera Road alignment. Camera Road doesn't continue over here. It, jump, it jogs up and Bilby Road actually f is, is the, is the uh, travel way. So uh, in, use, in, in, in staff, the applicant's request is that, they use, that we use the historic uh, non-surveyed urban services boundary. Uh, that's the southern boundary of one parcel, another parcel, a uh, larger parcel about uh, I think about 480 acres actually straddles. Uh, it would, half of it's roughly within the proposed area and half of it's outside of the proposed area. Uh, because the sphere of influence is not a surveyed boundary, it's a policy boundary that lends direction to the city that this may be an appropriate place for you to urbanize and you can start thinking in that regard. Uh, staff concurs with the proposal uh, as the applicants have put forward. Uh, one, of the, one of the wrinkles in this now is that we're back on the southeast connector. It does go all the way from Highway 50 to I-5, so the same connector we were talking about in the Folsom project uh, would be going, it would, would essentially be roughly along the south alignment of this area. Uh, however, uh, going through the exercise of, of uh, finding the optimal locations, the preferred alternative is shifts south of the alignment of Camera Road. There's about a, a balance in, the be, in between of about 26 acres that would remain <coughs> outside of the urban services boundary, outside of the sphere of influence boundary. Uh, the CEQA clearance, the uh, connector is was the lead agency on that project, and they have a mitigative neg negative declaration out on the street right now, uh, receiving public comment on, on <coughs> how, the, you know, how this preferred alignment can be mitigated as necessary. It's also, it's also tearing off of a uh, a, a, a programmatic yeah, environmental impact report. So uh, while there's some thinking about this, this gap area, uh, there are some uh, requirements that, to support the connector as far as drainage improvements necessary, some archeological mitigation. Uh, SMUD has a couple of uh, pretty high volume power structures down this way. So the, the, the alignment as proposed avoids in, uh, Need, needing to relocate those, which is the cost is, is fairly considerable, so there's a, a public benefit in the savings there as well. Uh, this position of staff to stay with the application as proposed and, and aligning with the urban services boundary. Uh, that doesn't preclude landowners or the city of Elk Grove at some point coming back as if, when, when the road is indeed developed uh, and, and asking for a change in their service boundaries or their sphere boundaries at that time. 
Uh, but also, any, any such request would have to address the uh, SASD, the Sacramento Regional Sanitation uh, boundaries, and then the board would have to con contemplate whether or not to push Sac County Water Agency's boundary, service boundary this area. Those are, that, that information really hasn't been vetted through the environmental process, so uh, that, that's why staff's comfortable recommended the, the, the proposed uh, project. Uh, right, right now, it, it, it also, as, as aligned, uh, as, as proposed, is within the urban development area of, of the proposed South Sac Habitat Conservation Plan. Uh, I believe that's going to go to hearing. It may perhaps next week, I think, uh, it's going to be taken up as far as adoption of that document. So that's another, another kind of a, a, a good point of uh, demarcation for, the, for this proposed op opportunity. There, the, uh, to help, help the analysis go forward, we worked with uh, the, the landowners to develop a conceptual land use plan. It's not a, it's not a committed land use plan. There's no pre-zoning, no general planning going on here. It's strictly your decision. Of, is this an appropriate location for the sphere? And so <laughs> many of the conclusions or, or uh, ideas put forward or brought forward concerns raised by the CEQA process are strictly for this, for, for this decision. In the event it does get, get approved, it goes back to the city, they would be in, in, the, in the position of go, doing the local land use planning, the general plan, the, their, the city is also in the process of uh, updating their general plan. I believe they just released their environmental documents, so that ball's rolling. Uh, and, and so that, that would really be where the uh, array of land uses would come from, would be from that pu public process there. So uh, th this, uh, as I say, this is a little, almost, almost a bit of a remnant parcel from previous, from incorporation days and what have you. Uh, the Municipal Service Review does a good job of laying out uh, the, where the services can come from. The affected agencies have all made clear that uh, in the case of regional SAN and SASD, it's already within their planning areas, so they've already got a, leg, a good step forward on, on how to uh, addressing means and capacity. Uh, same with uh, County Water Agency. Uh, I think it, 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 it makes sense to approve the project with the staff recommendations as, as recommended. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Very good, thank you. Any questions for staff at this point? Nope. All right. Seeing that, yes, Commissioner Greenwood. I have I have a question because in, in the write up and in, in reading this, I came across some words I'd never seen before. I don't really understand. Could you explain to me farmland of statewide importance? Because the mitigation measures require that at least one acre be set aside for. Right. I I I I, I want to defer if I could to uh, is our our, 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 our CEQA expert here. Yeah, right behind you. Mr. Angel. Uh, good evening, Chair Commissioners. Uh, yes, the, uh, the definition you're making reference, uh, state, uh, farmland statewide importance. Uh, the California Environmental Quality Act it defines prime, or uh, defines important farmland as three types. It defines prime farmland, farmland of statewide importance, and unique farmland. And that's how CEQIT defines it. So it's one of the three that is considered important, thus significant if it's developed. Okay. And how, how do you, how's, that cho how's that selection made as far as, I mean, it's a ma matter of definition, I gather, but. It's, it's a matter of definition. The state generates uh, important farmland maps that uh, are used okay. by us consultants to define So predetermined that. maps that are going to, okay. Correct, correct. Gotcha, okay, thank you. Before you leave, could you introduce yourself? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't do that, did I? You didn't. Uh, my name is Patrick Angel. I'm the project manager for the EIR. I'm from Ascent Environmental. Thank you. Okay, any other questions at this time? No? In that case, I'll open up for public comment. I do have a couple of speakers, or did the applicant like to speak first? Yes, please. Okay. Excuse me if I, I Yes. I, 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 my, over, I over, my oversight was uh, Patrick's here to present the uh, PowerPoint to touch upon probably those very issues that uh, Commissioner Green would just raise. So if we could run this real quick for the benefit of the public and the commission. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And now that we Hodgson know who you can are. use the exercise okay, I'm going back up and down again. the stairs there. So <laughs> now you can introduce yourself again. Again, I am Patrick Angel. I'm the project manager from Ascent Environmental. Uh, I will uh, provide you a brief overview of the environmental process. I know you've already heard two EIRs today, so uh, and I know several of you are already well versed in in the subject matter. So. Um, 
I always, whoops, there we go. So a couple of maps just to orient yourself again if you're not familiar with the property. Uh, the, it's 480 acres. It is uh, bounded three sides by the city. Uh, to the north and to the west is what was known as the East Franklin Specific Plan Area, which is largely built out. Uh, to the west is the Southeast Policy Area that is starting to develop and is an approved area plan of the city. So this is a picture of the typical conditions. It's in, it's in ag operation right now, some row crops. Uh, some vineyards and some cattle operation. Uh, the, again, as mentioned by Don, and I won't uh, go into further detail on this, it's a landowner request. There is no request for any sort of land use designations or entitlements or annexations. It's simply drawing the spear of influence and expanding it from the existing boundaries of the city. However, as Don mentioned, we did do a series of uh, land use scenarios saying if it would develop and would urbanize, what could it possibly look like? So the analysis assumed approximately, just slightly less of about 2,000 dwelling units, about 5,500 employees, about 4,300 residents could be out there. But again, this uh, Spear of Influence Amendment would not establish a land use um, uh, designation for the area. It would not entitle this. This is simply was an analysis we used to determine the effects. This is what the conceptual land use plan looked like that we, we used for the analysis. The project objectives were to uh, accommodate orderly growth, establish a logical boundary for future annexation, and establish a boundary that facilitates the protection of resources in the area. As mentioned uh, with the other two projects you looked at, this was a programmatic uh, environmental analysis. Again, there was no specific land use entitlement provided. Uh, it simply looks at what happens when you urbanize the area. Uh, annexation, once that comes through the process, will require subsequent environmental review. This environmental document may help that process, but it will require a re-review under CEQA. Very briefly, and I know, again, third, pro third EIR tonight, uh, I always like throwing this slide up because sometimes people get lost in what an EIR does and what an EIR doesn't do. It's important to note that an EIR as a disclosure document is to be used for your purposes of considering the environmental effects of the project as part of your actions tonight, to look at alternatives and to look at ways to mitigate the effects. What EIRs aren't intended to do is be advocacy pieces for a project, nor does an EIR require denial of a project. It's simply an information source for you to make the decisions you feel are appropriate, nor does it address pure social and economic issues. These are the environmental issue areas that were addressed in the EIR. These are the areas that have been identified as having significant and unavoidable impacts from future development. There were three alternatives that were looked at. I won't talk about the no project alternative because I believe that's self-explanatory. The uh, alternative two was a reduced sphere of influence where the sphere was reduced in half and would align to the western side of the city's boundary. This was an off-site alternative, uh, actually uh, adjacent to the uh, sports park site that you just uh, heard about earlier tonight. Since uh, the comment period was up, we received a total of 12 comment letters, and this is a highlight of the key comments we received. Uh, there were comments uh, asking for further detailed analysis of traffic impacts, intersection traffic analysis, things you typically would deal with if you actually had a defined land use plan or a subdivision map. We identified that the EIR in the responses analyzes the project at a program level. Biological resources was an issue primarily associated with participation in the HCP. The uh, ability for this project to participate in the HCP, even after establishment of the SOI, still exists. Ultimately, whether or not it will participate in the HCP will be a decision that the city and the, the property owner when annexation moves forward. There's nothing about this action that prohibits them from possibly participating in the HCP. Should they not participate in the HCP, there are mitigation measures to address those impacts. There are also concerns about buffering from agricultural uses south of the urban services boundary. Uh, there are mitigation measures in the EIR that address buffering. There's also Camner, which was mentioned, which will also act as a buffer uh, to the south. 
Then, as Don had mentioned, there was some discussion request to modify the southern boundary of the SOI area to match the proposed alignment of the Camden Road extension project. The final EIR acknowledges this, actually provides a, an initial analysis of what that would look like uh, associated with the land that would be outside of the development area of the roadway and provides that in the document. Uh, ultimately, as I believe Donna mentioned, the alignment hasn't been approved yet by the GPA. It was uh, uh, up for an informational item back in May, and I don't believe it's been scheduled for any action yet. So that line still, that alignment is still proposed. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions about the EIR. Any questions for Mr. Angel? I just have one question, Pat, with respect to your last bullet point there. You say the EIR, if the policy decision uh, were made to tie the boundary of the SOI to a future camera alignment, the EIR anticipates that and no further environmental would need to be done? There's an additional analysis if that area were to be developed and what the difference in impact would be. That information is, is provided. It's not provided as as an, a, a change or an amendment to the original EIR, it's just simply provided for informational purposes. The key difference being that you would be uh, considering development south of the urban services boundary. That's the biggest difference between that and the existing boundary. Okay, thank you. All right, now if the applicant would like to make a presentation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the commission. My name is John Hodgson. I am here on behalf of the Bilby Ridge SOI and the property owners, and specifically Catherine Bardis, who will speak for a couple minutes briefly. I intend to keep this very short because between what Mr. Lockhart has already presented in the staff report, including the recommendation and what Mr. Angels pointed out in the EIR, I think it's pretty evident that you have you know all the facts. I do want to um, point out, and, and I, I think everyone's heard this, this project is currently completely within the USB, and that's important to us. We thought that was a good reason, one, for us to bring this project forward. Um, we're a little uncomfortable by <laughs> moving a, a boundary outside the USB, um, and our preference would be n not to extend it. Um, um, the property itself is surrounded on three sides by development, and um, two-thirds of those uh, Two-thirds of that is already developed. Laguna Ridge are mostly developed in East Franklin. The other portion, the southeast study area, a southeast area, is in the process of development. Um, the ER has been uh, completed. Um, you know, uh, without saying too much, it, you know, there does not seem to be any objections of any significance. Uh, we had no one commenting at the uh, at the public workshop uh, a, a couple, well, uh, six eight months ago. Um, the MSR, Municipal Services Review, uh, indicates that all the services can be provided in almost every uh, agency. It's already within their, uh, their, their purview. And uh, again, I would point out that the land use plan that you saw was very, very conceptual. For purposes of the EIR, we had to identify something. We talked with the city. We looked at the surrounding area. We looked at what the city's general plan conceptually proposes for that big picture um, and the and the general plan update was just released a few days ago and it um, it shows this area as one of the study areas that the city is considering considering for potential future expansion with that I just ask uh, your your support of this uh, project and if you have any questions that may be happy to answer them any questions for mr. Hudson no? right. and Catherine okay. just talk for a second Good evening, commissioners. As Mr. Hodgson mentioned, my name is Catherine Bardis, and I am here as the applicant tonight. Um, everyone's clearly outlined why we think this project is a clear win and um, goes towards LAFCO policy on expanding a boundary. So I thought I would shed some light on what I do and why we are here tonight and in terms of timing of this project. Um, although I come from a long line of land developers and home builders, my dad, Chris, is actually in the audience tonight, probably to make sure I don't screw up, but um, I have been focusing on infill housing for the past six years where um, through our companies, Ryan and Bartis and Bartis Homes, we've built um, 
communities as small as six home communities or as large as thousand unit planned um, unit development projects within the greater Sacramento area. Homes range from 500 square feet to as large as a few thousand. And um, we've put in parks, we've um, developed commercial areas, and um, most recently we've been working on a project in Elk Grove to help bring a charter school and develop the site for them um, there. We have owned, um, well, had ownership interest in the Bilberry Ridge area since about 2013, and we think now timing is ripe to request expansion of the boundary, mainly because a lot of the infill sites in the Elk Grove area um, aren't necessarily developable. We actually are developing two sites in Elk Grove that are infill, one seven homes, another 16, and for the past few years I've been looking for more more sites that no avail. Um, so with that knowledge and with seeing the rapid pace of Elk Grove expanding and the number of permits pulled on a monthly basis, we think that our application is um, provides logical expansion into the Elk Grove area and would help provide for well thought out development. Um, we believe in diverse housing, we believe in diversity and development, and the only way to effectively achieve that would be through long-term planning and um, approval tonight would help us work with the city to accommodate the long-term planning that kind of meets everyone's goals as well as meets the city's needs. So with that, um, I hope that you don't have too many questions, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have and um, hope that we were somewhat helpful in our analysis. Any questions for Ms. Bardis? No? No? All right. Thank, Thank you, you very much. All right, at this time I will open it up for public comment, starting with Suzanne Pecci. For the record, my name is Suzanne Pecci. And first of all, I wanna point out a very significant staff error, and I don't know whether you can put this sheet up online so that the board can see, but in executive summary 1.0, and the page number is 1.0-3, there is a chart uh, that um, speaks, that sets out service provider, service provider um, provided SOI area, and um, if you look at that chart, I don't know if you can put it online, the city of Elk Grove is the service provider, and the services that would be provided by the city of Elk Grove are stated as being solid waste, roadway, law enforcement, animal control, code enforcement, drainage, and water. They are not a service provider for water. City of Elk Grove is not a service provider. The law, right underneath it, Sacramento County Water Agency, that line should have been drawn so that the line would show that the services Sacramento County Water Agency provides are water drainage irrigation. City of Elk Grove is not a water purveyor. So that should be corrected. Noted. Okay. The next comment with respect um, to a comment that Mr. Lockhart just made at, the, at today's meeting with respect to the MSR um, 4.0, Services, Infrastructure, and Facilities. The statement was that we have pretty much the guarantee of SCWA to be the water um, purveyor in this area, but the very first sentence of this section states, if approved, Bilby Ridge will provide direction to municipal water service providers about the location and extent of the city's growth. These two sentences, this does not match. 
There are no other water providers in this area. SCWA is the provider, and any other provider would have to either expand their boundaries and submit an application, or if you have a new agency coming in, they too would have to make application to LAVCO. So those, there is an inconsistency in what is being said and what is in writing. I think that should be looked at by the board before you vote, and it should be changed. This is the final document. The other comment I have to make again in on um, table ES-1, summary of impacts and mitigation measures, impact 3.1-2 deplete groundwater supplies or interfere substantially with groundwater recharge. Again, the statement is, future development of the SOI area upon annexation could result in groundwater usage and creation of impervious surfaces that could block groundwater recharge. Sacramento County Water Agency manages its supply in a conjunctive manner to protect groundwater resources, et cetera. So this statement is only true if Sacramento County Water Agency is in fact the water purveyor in that area. And there seems to be some questions in this document with exactly who the water purveyor is going to be. In writing, in the chart, which is unclear. Also, in the other document, on, pay, on the 4.0 service infrastructure and facility, MSR, determination on water. I just want to know what this means. The commission will make this determination after the draft, MSR, public circulation, and review period. So tonight, you will make that determination that SCWA will be the water purveyor. Is that, is that what I'm reading? The commission will make the, this determination so is that a guarantee? I mean, all of these things are kind of hazy as I read them. And again, we keep pointing to the logical purveyor would be SCWA because it is within their boundaries. But a lot of statements in this lead us to believe it's inconclusive as to who that purveyor would be. And I definitely think that chart needs to be clarified. City of Elk Grove is not a water purveyor. That line is drawn so that it shows their water. And people sh that are reading it should know. It should be corrected before any decisions are made. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Did staff make note of Suzanne's comments uh, on those four issues? Uh, yes. We, could, we can address them at time. the close of public comment. But uh, thank you. Next up will be uh, Lynn Wheat. Cable, can we have the second PowerPoint for this, this speaker, please? Good evening. My name's Lynn Wheat, and I'm a resident of Elk Grove. And I'm pro uh, providing pictures to accompany my comments tonight, because I think it's important for you to see the area, the 1,200 acres that I'm speaking to. So this is SEPA, the city's last 1,200-acre infill project. I stand before you tonight in opposition to the proposed sphere of influence application. My op opposition is from a land use and fiscal policy standpoint. From a land use policy standpoint, the city has stated that the southeast policy area, SEPA, is a 20-year plan that will correct the jobs housing imbalance and offer flexible land use zoning. If SEPA will serve our needs for the next 20 years, why do we need to rush into other unincorporated areas bordering the current city limits? A council member has said it's okay to plan 50, even 75 years into the future. But isn't it true that the longer you forecast into the future, the less accurate your projections will be? Why not wait five to seven years and see how SEPA projections are panning out?
From a fiscal policy standpoint, the city spent $23 million of taxpayer money to front load the infrastructure into SEPA as an incentive to develop and stimulate economic development and jobs. Why would we want to now approve an SOI expansion to accommodate annexation and in development in other areas and compete with our own 20-year SEPA plan? Encouraging outward expansion of, at the expense of underutilized infill land is a proven recipe for urban decay in the core of our city. I've not even touched on the vacant and underutilized infill property besides SEPA. I urge you tonight to find that this SOI expansion application is premature and, and, and counter to the city's ongoing efforts to encourage smart growth in SEPA, our 20-year plan. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, the last speaker I have signed up to speak is Jim Gillum. Chairman Hume, members of the commission, Jim Gillum, Gillum Consulting, uh, uh, representing a landowner within the sphere, uh, the Campbell property, as uh, Executive Director Lockhart mentioned earlier, we had submitted comments into the EIR to uh, seek the addition of an area of land that is anticipated to be outside the sphere if the proposed uh, boundary is adopted, but north of the Connector JPA roadway. After having further discussions with staff and, and co Commission Council, um, we understand that that would be something that would likely delay the approval of the sphere and therefore we are not requesting to move forward with that at this time. It'll have to be something that's cleaned up later. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do want to share with you that we are very supportive of the approval of this proposed application and look forward to uh, working with the City of Elk Grove on the planning of the overall project. And um, when the roadway ends up just south of the boundary, we'll have to clean that up at a later date. So I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions for Mr. Gillum? Nope. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else wishing to speak on this item? Okay, seeing no one, I will uh, close public comment unless the applicant has anything they wish to add. No? Okay. I have a, a question related to that last item, which obviously given that they're not pursuing it, I'm certainly not going to uh, fall on that sword, but just with respect to the existing urban services boundary, um, can somebody provide me some background as to why that, land, that line is where it is, which seems to me to be an arbitrary point. It, it, doesn't, it looks like it's tied to Camera Road, going straight out from Camera Road. Um, but normally, with a sphere of influence uh, amendment, doesn't LAFCO policy seek to have some sort of logical, natural boundary? Uh, typically, well, to, to kind of go back a little bit by way of history, the urban services boundary was, was established with the 1993 County General Plan. I wasn't involved in that process. But uh, the thinking at the time, my understanding was to draw a line uh, of the extent of urbanization for the county where services could be feasibly extended to accommodate. That, of course, 1993 predated uh, the incorporation of the city of Elk Grove. So uh, the, the history of that jog is more a matter of the, the function of the incorporation. Now, the uh, idea that the, the sphere uh, does want, it's to accommodate, it's to accommodate uh, the opportunity for long-range long planning, so that's, that's what our recommendation here is. But the idea that uh, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a fungible, fungible policy basis, I, I don't know that you want to, uh, we're, we're, we're hearing again and again that uh, it, you know, the, the, the difference in responses that we got uh, from service providers who rely on the urban services boundary, SASD and Regional San and the County Water Agency, uh, it, it, that allows them to, to use that, uh, th those are entities uh, that they can do their master planning reliant upon the urban services boundary, but they can't, uh, in, in the sense of, in, the, in this case of both the uh, Regional San and, and SASD, 
it's within their sphere of influence, which is established by the, in the unincorporated area by the, by the USB, but it's not within their service area. So there would be a subsequent annexations necessary to do the planning and the pickup of this area. So uh, I, I would say it's, it's a long held, uh, the, the idea of, uh, I, I believe you're, you are right, the, the finding a, a logical, identifiable place on the ground for a sphere is not, uh, it, it's more of a, a, a lack of criteria for the, when the, the, the uh, political boundary is changed through annexation. That way folks know who their service provider is going to be. Folks know uh, <laughs> traffic-wise or, or, or road-wise who to call for the pothole. That's something that, something that basic. So for, for the need, the, I think having a reasonable alignment at this time of an understood, uh, understood uh, uh, camera road uh, extension that's now been superseded by the uh, Capital Southeast proposed alignment. I, I think that the community is well served of understanding where that line is. Well, and I guess that's where we could, and I don't want to belabor this point too long because again, it, it's more or less moot at this point, but um, you know, it would seem that if the boundary for the urban services boundary, and I understand its purpose and its general history, but if it were tied to the extension of Camera Road as being its justification for why that line is in the sand, the reason Camera Road, the extension has shifted to the south via the Capital Southeast Connector Project is to allow for a grade separate, separated interchange at Bruceville and Camera Roads for the free flow of traffic. That meant we had to pull the roadway southward. So it would seem like logically you could say that the that line is just a line on a piece of paper that moves with whatever trigger it was attached to. Um, but if that's not how the world works, I, I understand that. I, I just it seems to me like we're we're quibbling over a fairly minor piece of land that there could be some potential, and it can get cleaned up at a later date. But there could be some potential drawbacks to not attaching developing property to roadway improvements. Well, I think that, and, and certainly that there there's opportunity to discuss all, all, all aspects of, of, the, of the line and movement where you're going to move it. Uh, but the, the JPA, the, the, the connectors being, being developed by a, a joint powers authority of which City of Elk Grove and County are cooperative members, uh, whether or not it's in, it's in the city, city sphere, county, that is, does not preclude the construction, the design of the road itself. So great separations. Uh, in this case, they've gone this, they've gone, this, this location was my understanding is more driven for to get the uh, the flyover uh, headspace necessary for the Union Pacific Railroad uh, to the just to the west uh, around Franklin Boulevard. Uh, you have much different uh, travel requirements for clearance between railroads, which is up on a it's on an mm -hmm. elevated levee, and the bridge versus uh, an urban interchange of, of uh, just vehicle access. access. So. By the line being where it is, uh, as proposed by staff and the applicant, uh, it doesn't preclude at, at the full development of, of, of the ext extension. The uh, development, the early stage requirement for this, this extension is uh, clearance of the rail, rail, railroad. The over, ultimate over, over time improvements for traffic flow that might be, be ne needed at uh, to separate ground, grade level tra uh, automobile traffic or whatever's being driven in 25 years, if anything, but uh, <laughs> that, that would be a decision that can be made as appropriate and it's not, it's not precluding the, the development. And uh, it, the, uh, another point to keep in mind is the <laughs> connector, one of the reasons the connector is, is, is being put forward is to efficiently move as a, a volume of, 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 tra of traffic and the traveling public. And so there's very, it's a limited access frontage, or limited access roadway. So uh, merely having frontage along it does not translate into having access to it. So it, it won't translate into that. <laughs> if I have any say about it, you're correct. So, so I don't know that, the, in, in talking with the folks over at the JPA, the connector JPA, they were uh, ambivalent about whether or not to, uh, that they, they, they agreed that the project was, has, has got environmental clearance uh, from this programmatic EIR and settlement agreements related to that. It's right now in its own NEGDEC uh, 
uh, review process and where this, the decision of your commission falls on the sphere of influence is not, not uh, a pro or a con to the development of that project. True. Any other questions of staff? No? Commissioner comments or deliberations? Starting with Commissioner Harrison. No, I look at the uh, map and I look at the boundary and uh, it's curious that uh, it ended up the way it is today, but to me it's a logical extension to Camera Road. You've got development on most sides by the city and I've, everything I've read, it seemed very logical to me to support the extension to that, uh, to that proposed location. Very good, thank you. Commissioner Jones? No comment. No comment. Commissioner Peters? I'll move the item. Okay. Second. Uh, second from Commissioner Frost. Commissioner Greenwood, did you have any comments? Uh, another other than just to uh, uh, dovetail with uh, Commissioner Harrison, I, I tend to agree that it's a logical move with the camera road. It just, it's, it's a rather small in consideration of everything, but it seems to fall in place. So, Thank you, and I, I would echo those comments as well as what I've read from uh, LAFCO mandate, this pretty much is exact kind of uh, project that it calls out for. Okay, Chair, if we can have, Chair, yes. Chair, Chair Hume, I could just make a, a, a quick response. I appreciate the, the clarifications or, or the points raised by public testimony and the, the MSR, which is included with the, with the public record. We will correct that table. At any Thank case, you. Who, who's, who would be the water service provider and the other comments will be clarified. Thank you so much. I, I'm sorry about that, Suzanne. I forgot to loop back to that. Thank the, you. The motion includes the corrections to the table. Second. And the second does as well. Okay, if we can please have the vote on the screen. You, do you want a roll call vote? Is that what no, you're asking for? No. Do we? <coughs> or you're talking about all of the different. Yeah. Just resolutions? a quick question. Do we? Uh, do we need uh, individual motions for the four recommendations, or can we do it as one? Yeah, we can do it as one. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. In the order, the first. Of course. Of course. Okay. Very good, looks like it passes unanimously. All right, Madam Clerk, if you'd please read the next item. Our next item is the questions and announcements from the staff and the commission, and then we have a closed session after that. I, just re real quickly, uh, for the benefit of the commission and the public, wanna give folks a little bit of a heads up. Uh, Commissioner Harris's uh, term as public member expires at the end of this calendar year, December 31. He's indicated that uh, it, it may be appropriate to recruit a new, a new member. Uh, the clerk will be pre preparing that process and will uh, report to the, your commission in September, kicking that process off to fill the public member seat. Uh, the alternate public member seat expires at the same time, so both positions will be open for uh, the interest of the, uh, the public. And then also, just to remind the commission, we will be on recess in October uh, in in light of the CalAFCO uh, statewide convention conference. Very good. Any questions for the executive director? No. All right. Any general comments from commissioners? All right. In that case, we will move into closed session. Yes. We need to announce a closed session. Closed session. We have no re reportable actions, and so the meeting stands. The meeting stands adjourned at seven oh six.